guns. You good girls. Uh. Okay, can everybody hear me? How's it sound? Can you hear me okay? Ah. Woo! Let's see here. Cool. Sounds good. Looks good too. A new microphone and a new camera. So I'm hoping that this looks somewhat professional. I eat a piece of this before I get going. I got a dry throat. Mmm. Curtis asked me what kind of camera it is. It's a a Logi, L O G I. Um. I forget what kind, but it's a it's the 1080 pixels. So it's pretty decent. It was only like a hundred bucks. I think I might have bought it from somebody who stole it. This is, I think they're supposed to cost more, but it was unopened, brand new, and it only was only a hundred bucks. So I don't care where he got it from. Mm hmm. So Earl says, um, do you play any? old time spiritual songs like down by the river to play. I don't, I don't think I've ever done. Um, what was that song? Uh, oh brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. I've never done that on the banjo, but I have done a lot of, um, old time gospel songs before. Um, ah, that's one I used to do in Triple C. Um, Jesus on the main line. Y'all look up Fred McDowell doing Jesus on the main line. I used to do that quite a bit. Woot says they're happy to see me doing this uh, during EU friendly hours. I'm glad to hear that. I thought long and hard about when to do this stream. And I would probably have done it on the weekend, but I'm going to be out of town this weekend. Now, the sweat bees are already on me. Um, so I wondered, I just figured I'd do it Tuesday at, at two o'clock in the afternoon. I figured most of us who care about this music probably live east of the Mississippi and west of uh, like west of Poland or whatever. So I figured anybody who's in that time zone, you know, North America and Europe. Uh, could probably could probably get to hear this. We got our first super chat, five dollars Canadian. Olivier Leduc says, "Good day to you, Mr. Hicks. I was really hyped after your last live, so I'm super stoked to see you online. Did you learn O Death by any chance? I still haven't. I haven't picked that up. I can sing it, but I haven't haven't ever tried to play it on the banjo." Hear the boats are 
up the devil. Won't come down. Tell by the way that she's headed. Alabama bound. Well, she's Alabama bound. Lord. Alabama bound. Tell by the way that she's headed. Alabama bound. up the river is what you should probably call that boats up the river i learned that from an old recording of ola bell reed now, ola bell reed is really great if y'all i'm sure you've all heard of her but excuse me if you haven't heard of ola bell reed you ought to look her up she's got some really good stuff she did a lot of original pieces that are really good she was one of the few people who could compose an original song that sounds like it's a hundred or more year old she was really cool. Oh, let's see, let me pick one of these good ones out. I'm going to try this day to not get a bunch of watermelon juice all over my banjo. Frederick Newbill gave us $5. Hey, Fred, how you doing, buddy? Fred's my friend out in California, originally from Jacksonville, same place. I, I was born in Jacksonville, although I don't remember it. Fred says he's always happy to hear from me, as am I, sir. Likewise. <clears throat> so we got mic issues. Did it sound like it was underwater for everybody? This damn thing. Let me see here. See if I can fix it. Sean O'Rourke asks if I've ever heard of the still has still house shakers. I have. I've never, I've, uh, they're from, so I think they're down in, uh, Sarasota or something like that. I wonder what's going on with this mic. This is supposed to be a good microphone. Weird. I think, I wonder if that mic does it, if it's doing something when it plays music. Ah, I figured it out. I guess this mic isn't, it maybe isn't as good as I thought. 
but it's got to be better than the laptop mic. Um, somebody asked me a question here. I want to. I wanted to see. So life sized Barbie said in one of your other videos, you mentioned how you think the term claw hammer is problematic. Why is that? Um, so that's that's a fun story. There, um, hey, tippy girl. So problematic. I mean, if you want to use the term, most of us are already using the term to describe down picking and, you know, good luck trying to change that. Um, so I'm not saying that people shouldn't use the term, you know, when I say it's problematic, I'm just trying to explain why I, I don't use the term. I, I try not to. And of course, I mean, I started out using the term cause that was, um, that was the term everybody used. But if you want to go back, you know, what, when is the earliest date that anybody used the word claw hammer to describe um, down picking. You won't find that term being used to describe down picking before 1965. The term was used before 1960s. As far as I can tell, the term claw hammer as a term for playing music originated probably in the 1890s as a way is really as a derogatory term to describe three finger pickers who were not playing the classic banjo style. So if you're not familiar with classic banjo, that's basically what every, what all the, that was like the professional commercial minstrel music from about 1880 up to the, maybe the 1920s is when it kind of fell out of popularity in the United States, definitely by the thirties it had fallen out of popularity. And they also, the terminology is really confusing. So the classic banjo players of, of the period in the classic banjo period, they didn't call it classic banjo, of course, cause they were, they were living in that period. Um, so they didn't call it that they called it the guitar style. And the guitar style was a commercial, um, you know, basically pop music style that they developed for playing the banjo from classical guitar playing. So, you know, that, that sort of three finger or more where the people have long fingernails and they play guitar like that. Think of Spanish guitar and stuff. So the guitar style banjo players were all they all had learned from, you know, out of books and from banjo teachers and stuff. And, uh, you know, they were mostly pretty pretentious, kind of like they are today still. Um, I guess maybe all, all banjo players are guilty of some kind of pretension. But the guitar style players were really pretentious. They're mostly urban, um, you know, often wealthier white people from the city, from northern cities who'd learned from uh, master banjo teachers. Think of like, you know, Samuel, or Samuel Swain Stewart, right? He, like S.S. Stewart. He's like the guy that was like probably the most pretentious uh, classic guitar style banjo player ever, right? So they came up with a term, I think, probably in the 1890s, early 1900s, and they called, because when people started, people came up with their own three finger styles of playing, but they weren't guitar style, they weren't classic banjo. So that term claw hammer originally came about as a derogatory way to describe somebody who played three finger, but did not play guitar style um, did not play the classic banjo style. And that's what it persisted as. And you will not see, and the term was, was really rare anyhow, you will not find that term describing overhand downpicking banjo until the 1960s. And really, I want to say it's about 1965. Um, it was right around, let's say, in, in the neighborhood of 1965. So in the mid 60s, they started. You all have heard of the 1960s folk revival, right? Uh, I call it the urban folk music revival because it was mostly um, young intellectuals from places like Washington, D.C. and places like New York City who did not grow up in the traditional you know, banjo tradition, the old time music tradition. Um, they learned that there was, you know, this banjo tradition, most of them, you know, their exposure, their first exposure to banjo was Earl Scruggs uh, on TV. 
So when they saw Earl Scruggs playing music on TV, they were also familiar with Grandpa Jones and String Bean and stuff. And I think Earl Scruggs in the late 40s and 50s is who really brought the banjo back into the mainstream for the first time in, you know, decades, right? Many decades. So all these young academics, people like Mike Seeger, um, Pete Seeger, John Cohen, uh, and I could go on. So people like that from the D.C. and New York City kind of areas, they learned that there was people playing this great banjo music in the mountains. So they went to the mountains. So they poured out of places like D.C. and New York. They brought tape recorders with them. It was the first time people could really get a cheap tape recorder then in the 60s. And you could hop in a car and, and actually drive on the highway and get up into the mountains fairly quickly from from uh, D.C. or New York. I and mean, that was the first time that it really happened. So they went up in there and they they encountered they were probably looking for Scruggs players. And mostly they found overhand drop thumb down pictures. Um, so then they recorded these people and, and thought it was great. And so in those days, somehow, I don't really know how exactly this happened, but some of those urban folk revivalists encountered the term claw hammer. And they encountered it as a way to differentiate between basically there was Scrugg style bluegrass banjo and then everything else was sort of considered claw hammer, whether they were finger picking or down picking or whatever. But really, like I said, originally claw hammer was used to describe vernacular finger picking styles. And it was a derogatory term to say that's not real guitar style banjo playing. That's not real classic banjo playing. That's just claw hammer. He's just hammering around, right? And also, if you think about it, if you look at, at, at the way when you're three finger picking, you can kind of see the nose of the hammer and the claws of the hammer. You can kind of see that. And it's even, it even kind of looks like a, like a claw hammer. So it really makes sense when, when you think about it that way. And also, you can look today, I think to this day in, in places like, I've seen um, guitar, finger picking guitar manuals that were printed in England in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and they call it claw hammer guitar. And they are teaching a, a sort of vernacular folk three finger style. That's my understanding. They're not teaching you how to down pick the guitar. There are claw hammer manuals printed in England for guitar, claw hammer guitar, and they're teaching you three finger. So claw hammer did originally start out as a way to describe folk finger picking. So anyhow, fast forward all the way to the 60s. I know this is terribly long winded, but it needs to be explained. Around the early 1960s, you had all these young kids from D.C. and New York who didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Um, and one of them was Pete Seeger. And Pete learned to play the banjo in, I think, the early 40s, late 30s. Pete learned to play the banjo in the mountains by, by traveling up there and hanging out with people. And you'll notice Pete Seeger's first banjo tutor came out shortly after Second World War. It came out, I want to say, 1949 or 1950 is when Pete published his first How to Play the Banjo. And if you look through that book, you will not find the word claw hammer anywhere in Pete's book. So that apparently was a term that Pete had not encountered. Otherwise, he would. Pete listed all these other terms for it, but he didn't list claw hammer. And Pete himself seems to have um, been the first person to print the term frailing. So frailing is another term that that really doesn't is not traditional. It doesn't predate the 1940s. The earliest documentation that we can find of that maybe where frailing came from is a radio announcer talking about Cousin Emmy. So if you're not familiar with Cousin Emmy, she was a super famous, you know, overhand down picker banjo player from Kentucky. Cousin Emmy actually taught um, Grandpa Jones how to play the banjo. He didn't know how to play the banjo until he started working with Cousin Emmy, and she taught him. And that's something that people don't discuss a lot. Um, Cousin Emmy gets sort of glossed over, and everybody's looking at Grandpa Jones, but really he kind of learned his whole shtick from Cousin Emmy. That's pretty interesting. So in, in the 40s, right after World War II, I think there was a radio announcer who was describing how Cousin Emmy played the banjo. Um, and he said that she played it in this wild, flailing manner. So he used the word flail, F-L-A-I-L, to describe how Cousin Emmy played. He said she played it like she was flailing the banjo. 
and flail and flailing are that's an actual word. So people, there's a there's a tool that consists of two two sticks that are tied together in the middle, and old timers used to use that flail to flail and beat uh, wheat. So when you harvest wheat, you lay it on a threshing floor and you thresh it with a flail, and that beats the husk off of it and brings the grain out, so that you can then scoop that up and mill it and make flour, right? So they used a flail and they kind of used this flailing motion when they threshed that wheat. And so that was kind of how Cousin Emmy played. So that's where I think I'm convinced that's where the term flailing comes from, 1940s. And it comes from Cousin Emmy flailing the banjo uh, like it was a damn flail because there's no such word as frail. And if you look at, I mean, frailing, and if you look at, if you try to find the term frailing, if you just look it up in the Library of Congress or look through old books, you will not find it before the 1940s. Um, so anyhow, so that's how frailing come about as a term. So when we get into claw hammer, so I've already described claw hammer was used to describe three finger picking and it gets really confusing. How did it make the jump from describing three finger picking where you got the claws of the hammer and the nose of the hammer here? How did it get from that to describing this where you make a claw and you hammer with your thumb, right? So that happened in the 1960s and it was in North Carolina. I want to, I'm not sure if it was Mount Airy, one of those places, um, maybe Galax, Virginia. It was one of those places, Surrey County, somewhere around there, they had a banjo contest and they hadn't had a banjo contest in many years. They were trying to revive this old tradition of banjo contests. So a bunch of these academic kids from New York and DC got together one summer about 1965 and they got together with Clarence Ashley, Tom Ashley. And Tom basically helped them organize this banjo contest, which was the first banjo contest that they'd held in the area, like I said, in a long time. And they realized that they had to do two categories. They were gonna have a bluegrass category, and then everybody else who didn't play bluegrass, who played the folk styles, that was the, they called that the claw hammer category. And so and back in the day, in the, in the 60s, when they first started reviving these traditions, you could go to, um, you know, an old time banjo contest or a fiddler, old time fiddlers convention. And for the banjo contest, they had have two categories. They had bluegrass and they had claw hammer. That's how they did it this one time. And like I said, claw hammer just meant everything. Finger picking, three finger picking, two finger picking, up picking and down picking like what we today call claw hammer. So what happened was at that festival, pretty much all of the banjo players entered the claw hammer category and they were all down pickers because this was in like Western Carolina or uh, Southwest Virginia. And every banjo player who entered was a down picker. So all of those kids from New York and DC who were there organizing that banjo contest that year, they saw, Oh, that's claw hammer. And that became associated with the term. So where it really got set in stone was one of those young, a young man who was there learned and I think probably learned to play the banjo that summer. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget his name, but you can look it up. He, he went back. He was from New York city. Surprise, surprise. He went back to New York city um, and he recorded an album, a solo album of just himself playing the banjo. And he played like this, you know, that down picking style he called his album claw hammer banjo and it was really popular in new york city in certain circles like in that that sort of beatnik folky um you know intellectual circle in new york city everybody bought the album and everybody thought that's claw hammer banjo that's how you're supposed to do it so you asked why do i no longer use the term and I try to I use caution with the term. I consider claw hammer a problematic term. It's because it's not really a traditional term. It originated in the 1890s, probably up north as a derogatory term for three finger pickers. And then it remained in obscurity until about 1965 when once again, people from out of the South, out of the tradition in, in New York City and DC erroneously applied that label to downpicking. And they basically made everybody 
everybody had to agree with that. They all they all agreed with it. And they're the ones who, you know, where was all the recordings made? Where were all the records produced? Where were all the music tutors produced? Where were all the music manufacturers? Where were all the music shops, all the music teachers? They were all up north, focused around DC and, uh, and New York City. So they, like they do today, they set the, um, the tempo for the, for the revival. They said, this is the terminology. This is what has to be used. This is claw hammer, this is not. And it was all erroneous, all pulled out of their ass. So when I say uh, that claw hammer is a problematic term and I try not to use it and I encourage others not to use it, that's why. It comes from the 1960s. It comes from New York City. So, you know, me as a traditional banjo player, I've lived most of my life in Georgia. I learned most of my music from people from East Kentucky and Western Carolina and East Tennessee and Northern Alabama. I, you know, I'm not saying I don't have anything against anybody in New York or DC, whatever, that's fine. But that has nothing to do with, with my music. The music that I consider the real traditional banjo music doesn't come from New York City, doesn't come from Washington, DC. And it damn sure doesn't come from 1965. It's 200 years or more older than 1965. So I don't use the term claw hammer, except if I'm on, I got to put a video up on YouTube and if I want people to click on it, um, I got to put up claw hammer because that's just, you know, uh, that that makes more people see it. So that's why, you know, I use the term very reluctantly because it's a 1960s New York City bullshit term. Doesn't have anything to do with real vernacular old time banjo. So. That's a real, I know that was long winded, but that's the way it goes. Uh, there's a lot more to that story as well. I know all of that because George Gibson, the guy who taught me most of what I know, researched the hell out of all that. And he's actually written an article and he shared the rough draft with me. And it's a good thick article with lots of details. He names names. He knows the dates and the places and the who, what, when, where, and why. He basically, I guess for lack of a better term, he debunks uh, the origins of claw hammer banjo. It really is. It's, it's from the 1960s. And that's why if you look at these players, people from, you know, like New York and D.C. and further north and stuff, uh, you know, the, I, I won't name names, but if you look at some of how they play, you can tell it's not traditional. I've touched on this before um, many times. And the reason it's not is because they didn't actually learn from any tradition. They learned from 1965 uh, tutors written by people from New York City. I'm going to go up. I know I saw I got a, a good super chat and I want to answer that person. Sean O'Rourke asked me to do Rocky Island. He sent me $5. Okay, I better do it. So Act Knight gave me $20 and asked if they could buy a fretless mountain banjo from me. Sure, Act, you just got to, um, I don't have any right now. I'd have to build one. So the best thing you can do is email me. I've plastered my email up all over the place. So you should be able to find my email address. That's the best way you can get in contact me with me about something like that. Maybe this winter I'll build some. I built, I think I built two or three last winter. Rocky Island. I like to do Rocky Island and double C with the the fifth string tuned down real low. Let's see, I haven't played Rocky Island in a long time. I have to think about this. Going on a Rocky Island. Hey, honey, ho. Thank you. 
You take the highway, I'll take the low. Going on a rocky island, ain't never coming home. Rocky Island, close enough. I haven't done that in a while. Okay. So Pseudo Dionysus says, is it okay to use the middle finger for overhand? Yeah, it's okay. Um, that's another thing I... I do, I encourage people to use their first finger, use your, your trigger finger when you're down picking. That's the way I've always done it. It's good to be able to use your middle finger because, you know, over the years you're going to, you're going to have injuries, you know, to your, to your forefinger. And so you're going to want to use your middle finger. But so that really, that's the only time you'll see me picking with my middle finger is if my, if my trigger finger is injured. Um, so it's okay. You can use the middle finger only. I mean, if that's the finger you want to do, I, I think that that's another thing that sort of stems from Pete Seeger. I think Pete Seeger in his 1950, 1949 banjo manual, the first one he ever published, I think he actually recommends using the middle finger. So lots of people still to this day, there are some people who will say that that's the proper way to use your middle finger is the proper way. And that's all because of Pete Seeger. Um, I think, um, but really, I think that the your trigger finger gets in there a little better. And one thing, like if you're picking with your middle finger, what happens to your trigger finger? I see a lot of time it just it just kind of flops around, you know. Um, it just kind of flops around, and so I feel like you shouldn't you shouldn't waste any fingers on your, on either of your hands. Right. So if you've got all five fingers, why you should play with all five fingers. So even when I, when I overhand down pick, I'm playing with all five of these fingers. I'm getting, you know, the, the melody comes out of my trigger finger, sometimes my thumb. So my thumb and my trigger finger are doing it all. Like you, you could cut these fingers off and just leave me with this and that. And I could still play overhand, you know, similar to the way I do now, but I have all these spare fingers and you'll see I'm constantly brushing with all of these fingers. And it's really, especially if you're going to get like, um, like that sort of Rufus crisp, double shuffle, George Gibson kind of roll going. The only way to get a real smooth roll like that is to, pick that that melody note with your trigger finger thumb the thumb string with your thumb and then brush out with these with these fingers on the off beat so what i'm doing there is i'm you 
kind of, I like to use all my fingers. So for that reason, and also I do think that the trigger finger is more accurate. It's a thinner finger so you can get in there more accurately, but that's really up to you. But I just encourage people, especially new banjoists, to if you can play with your trigger finger, that's the finger you probably should use if you're able to, if, if it's comfortable to you. I would really encourage people to use that because as you get to be a more advanced player on down the road, you're going to find things to do with these three fingers. And if your trigger finger is sitting up like a limp sausage, you can't use it for anything. Not, not that I can figure out. And just it just gets in the way. It's just like having this uh, useless appendage. So I don't want any useless appendages. If I have 10 fingers, I'm using all 10 fingers to play the banjo. So that for that reason, I always encourage people to play with your with your your forefinger, your trigger finger, if you can. It's OK to use the middle finger. It's OK. But I just think that after playing for what, 22, 23 years now, I've thought about this a lot. And I do think that the middle finger is the one is the way to go. The trigger finger is the way to go. Okay, we got some good super chats here. I'll try to get in on some of y'all. I know I've skipped some of these. Damn, that's a lot of chats. Um, so he wanted me. So okay, um, Sean wanted me to do Rocky Island. I hope that was good enough for you. I responded to act. So Garrett Faulkner says he got to run and catch you on the recording later. Thanks for all you do. Okay, Garrett, I appreciate the five dollars, man. Thank you. We do have a lot of chat people chatting in here, y'all. So and I'm, I'm glad about that. But if you want me to actually see it, you throw me a dollar or ninety nine cents at least, so I can it'll pop up and I can see it and answer your question. Um, so Blaine Chapel gave us five bucks. He says Fairbanks electric or similar with scallop tone ring, eighteen eighties. Dobson tone ring or high level SS Stewart, your pick of the three. So which would so Blaine, are you asking which would I play? Which which would I prefer? That's that's tricky. You know, I like the fancy SS Stewarts. I think they're great. Um, but I guess they all I, mean, I would play any of those. I think probably the Fairbanks electric is probably the most advanced. Um, with the scalloped tone ring, I've played a couple of those that were just really nice. You know, they're really desirable. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I would, I probably wouldn't pick the SS Stewart just because there's so many Stewarts out there. They're all great. That the high end Stewarts are wonderful banjos, but you know, when you you know what a Stewart is going to sound like. Uh, at least I do before I pick it up. It's going to sound, you know, real plucky and bright and loud. And they're nice light banjos usually, which is good. Um, but when it comes to those other two with the tone, I don't know, man. I'd be happy to play any of them. But the uh, 1880s Dobson with the Dobson tone ring is really nice. Like the Silver Bell. Those are really nice. I don't know, Blaine. That's tough, buddy. Why do you ask if you got to make that choice yourself? Misty Miner says she just got her shirt. Shirts? How many? You ordered uh, more than one <laughs> in the mail today and gave me another $10. Thanks a lot, Misty. So, yeah, for those of you all who don't know, I do. I'm slinging T-shirts now. You can find the link in the in the description. Unfortunately, they're 25 bucks a pop, but they're supposed to be pretty nice T-shirts. And if you get the one that says outlaw old time, it's it's a big old, <laughs> you know, to the assholes. Hmm. Blaine says he's in a dilemma between the Dobson and the Fairbanks. Well, Blaine, I don't know. 
the Dobson is what is going to get you all the uh, all the hippie street cred. The hippie, the, fos- the festival hippie people love the Dobsons. It's all Dobson, Dobson, Dobson tone ring, Dobson tone ring, because they're nice banjos. People really like that. I think the only difference. If you if you're down between the Dobson, because yeah, Blaine, you've already had a fancy steward or two. If you're if you're down between the Dobson and the Fairbanks, I would get the Fairbanks. Fairbanks Electric is probably a brighter, pluckier sound, which I which I would probably prefer. Um, the Dobson tone ring is nice, but it's sort of a a ringing, a more of a ringing tone. Um, and tends to tends to be a little less sharp and, and and plucky, which I which I like that that punch. So I think if if you're like me and you want to put nylons and and a a lightweight maple bridge on it like I've got there, and get it to sound plucky as you can, I would get the Fairbanks um, electric because I've definitely played some of those that just blew my blew my socks off so dodo dodo gave us a hundred rubles i think that's what that is from is that what are you in is that russian money 100 rubles that sounds like a lot of money thanks buddy and asks if i ever considered writing a book about banjo heritage and my journey with it i would like to do something like that writing books is really hard i've actually sat down and tried to write books and it is hard uh i've successfully written you know some some decent academic articles maybe one or two like when i was in school i wrote like some i wouldn't even call it an article it's more like essays i wrote some really good maybe like 20 page archaeology essays about domestication of dogs actually in places like um, russia and siberia is where dogs were first domesticated 30 40 thousand years ago so i've written some long um, very serious essays about stuff like that, but I kind of shy away from from writing a lot, organized writing about banjo history and banjo heritage. Maybe when I'm older, if I live long enough, I'll do something like that. I'd really like to. I need to. It's just, dagum, it's hard, y'all. Um, and to organize it too. I mean, gosh, you have to. I feel like I, I still feel like I don't know enough to, to write a book about anything. Be kind of pretentious. I mean, I'm only 35 years old. It's like, what the hell do I know? You know, but obviously there's no shortage of, um, there's no shortage of material. I have no shortage of opinions. And really I, I've been at it for 22, 23 years and I've been actively studying it. I mean, dreaming about it. I, I wake up thinking about it. I go to sleep thinking about it. I think about it while I eat. Um, and I still feel like I'm just scratching the surface, you know? So I feel like that's kind of silly of me to, to write a book. So Christian Govig asks me if I like any guitar pickers. Um, yeah, sure. Roscoe Holcomb <laughs> was a great guitar picker. That's, that's me cheating. But if you want to know who I think are the the best guitar pickers that I've ever heard and recordings and stuff, I mean, it's almost cliche to say his name, but Mississippi John Hurt, man, that that three finger guitar player of John Hurt, Mississippi John Hurt. I think he's about probably the best guitar player that ever lived. I mean, his music is amazing. His versions of songs are the best. It's kind of like almost like George Gibson, if you. You hear a song like Rocky Island, you hear a hundred different versions growing up. You never thought anything of it. But then you you um when you when you hear George Gibson play Rocky Island for the first time, it, it'll blow your mind, you know. That's how it was with Ben. That version that I play I, I stole from George Gibson. It's the same way with um with uh, Mississippi John Hurt, for example. You listen your whole life, you grow up hearing versions of um of uh, Stagali and John Henry and stuff like that. But when you hear Mississippi John Hurt play them, those are the best versions. It, it cannot, you know, Stagali cannot be played better. Um, Frankie and Albert cannot be played better. John Henry cannot be played better than the way that Mississippi John Hurt does it. Absolutely outstanding. So that's, that's sort of um, a mainstream answer because he's world famous. I could dig a little deeper. I mean, uh, 
Mance, Lus Mance Lipscomb. Mance Lipscomb, M-A-N-C-E, Lipscomb, Mance Lipscomb. He was an old guitar player from uh, from Texas. He was a two-finger picker, I'm pretty sure. And he's really damn good. Um, he died a long time ago, but Mance Lipscomb was great, y'all. Um, probably my personal favorite out of all of them is Fred McDowell. Now, they, they erroneously called Fred, they called him Mississippi Fred McDowell, but he wasn't from Mississippi. He was from Tennessee. Um, but he didn't care when people called him Mississippi Fred McDowell. So look up Fred McDowell. Fred, his earlier recordings, he played an acoustic arch top and just slayed it. But if you most of the stuff you'll find about Fred, like on YouTube and so forth, he's playing electric and he's got a slide. He's playing electric slide guitar and he is damn good, outstanding guitar player. So look up Mance Lipscomb. Look up Fred McDowell. Um, and then, yeah, so look, look up, you know... Um, who else was really good on the guitar? I don't know. There's a there's a, some field recordings by a guy in Eastern Kentucky named Daw Henson, Little Daw Henson. They called him D A W Henson. He was a great guitar player. He played old timers like Moonshiner and Going Across the Mountain, stuff that we think of as banjo songs. He played them on guitar. Played the hell out of them. Pseudo Dionysus gave us four bucks. Thank you. Oh, and you asked, um, what's the tuning for Bloody Bill Anderson? That's in um, F sharp, D, G, A, D. Can you? And then somebody wants me to play Wild Bill Jones. Bloody Bill Anderson. I don't remember how I played Bloody Bill Anderson. I don't remember. You know, honestly, I don't remember the words to that pseudo. I'm sorry. It's in F sharp D G A D. I could, I'd have to, I'd have to re-familiarize myself with the words. Um, but I think that I played that song the same way that I do Drunkard's Lone Child. So if you look up um, how I do Drunkard's Lone Child, that's F sharp D G A D. And I think when I did Bloody Bill Anderson, I think I just played Drunkard's Lone Child and then I sung their, um, uh, Jimbo and um, David Youngblood Hart's lyrics over that. So I think that's all there is to that. Um, so to Toshigi Climbing Bear wants me to play Wild Bill Jones. Thank you. 
Um, I'm interested to know how the mic is sounding, y'all. Does it still sound underwater when I when I'm playing the banjo? Uh, yeah, this banjo is actually it's only an eleven. It's not quite twelve inch rim. It's eleven and five eighths. And the neck is, it's a 20, I think it's a 27 inch scale, but you see how the bridge falls way back here. Cause it's not that there's fewer frets on this than there would be on a typical 27 um, inch scale banjo. I think that's what happened. I've been trying to figure out how they designed this banjo, why they made it the way they did. Sounds a little funky in the mic. I don't know. I'll probably have to mess with the with the microphone settings. I don't know this mic has done that before and i think it's i think it's set to for like recording speech or something and so it automatically starts cutting out when i do music i'm gonna have to keep messing with it and try to figure it out What is my dog's name? I got two dogs. The darker dog is named Copper. The uh, lighter dog is Mexico. Mexico. 
Woots is asking if I got any new music coming out on Spotify. No, I put up a new one this year. So it'll probably be maybe next year I'll put up another one. So Inquisitor Jones asked me if I know the Patter Roller song. You talking about um, Run Jimmy Run, the Patter Roller Get You, Run Jimmy Run, You Better Get Away? Yeah, I know that song. I just uh, I did a video of it not long ago and a lesson. So uh, you can even like, taught people how to play that damn song. Yeah, I'm going to have to work on this microphone, y'all. See what see what the problem is. I'm just going back through seeing if I can find any good answer some of these questions that came through. So Grant Hobson gave us $2 and he said, what would you suggest pricing amateur banjos at? What do you mean, Grant? Do you mean um, a banjo made by an amateur or a banjo that's made by a professional marketed to amateurs? Um, if you mean a banjo that's marketed to amateurs made by, probably about the same, really. I mean, I wouldn't want to pay for something like a, For something like a um, like a like if you're going to get a, a Deering Good Time or a, a Recording King or something, I wouldn't pay more than four hundred dollars for either of those banjos. I understand, you know, like new like a new Good Time is like five hundred something now. They're kind of just not really worth worth that much. So I always tell people if you're trying to get if you're an amateur if you're looking for an amateur like a, a beginner banjo, I would call it. Don't spend, you know, don't spend more than four hundred dollars on something like a Good Time or a Recording King or a Gold Tone. Absolutely never buy. I wouldn't buy any banjo new, frankly, because any any brand new banjo, they're astronomically overpriced. You can't get anything for less than thirteen hundred, fifteen hundred dollars, and frankly, they're just not really worth that much. I sell really nice antique banjos all the time for $700, $800, even if I sell them for $1,000 or um, $1,500 or something like that. Um, you know, hell, uh, I wouldn't pay more than, I mean, no banjo is worth is worth more than like $800, bucks, 900 bucks tops based on the amount of work that goes into it and the materials. So anytime you're paying more than about eight or nine hundred dollars for a banjo you're paying for fancy inlay or you're paying for the name or something like that um Let's see. Oh, let's see. Alan Ackerson gave us ten dollars. Thank you, Alan. But I, so, Grant, I still haven't answered. So, what would you suggest pricing amateur? So, if you mean a banjo that's made by, let's say, if you're an amateur builder and you've built one, what are you going to sell it for? So, I would say the same price range, four or five hundred dollars out the gate. The first banjos that I built, like the first mountain banjo that I ever built to sell. I think I only sold it for like 350 bucks to somebody um, and it sold quickly. And then I think I quickly went up and I sold them, started selling them for 400. Any banjo I made, I would sell for 400. 
Um, now I'm still, I'm still an amateur builder. Uh, I'm by no means like a master luthier or anything like that. So if I was going to build a banjo and sell it still, my bottom line is like 500. Now I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to build and, and sell an instrument for less than 500. Um, but once, once you start get, like I said, once you get up towards 800, $900, that's where banjo, the value of what a banjo is actually worth really tops out at like eight or $900. So just think about that. So if you want to build a banjo, your first one and sell it, I don't know what type, it depends on the type of banjo, how much you spend on the materials, if you spend anything at all on the materials. So for, to, to get to get to, to sell that banjo, once you've built it, to get it out the gate, you might have to go low on the price and sell it for 350 uh, you know, 390 something like that to get it sold to somebody just to start getting your name out there, you know. It's one of those things you're not going to, you're not likely to earn a good hourly wage as a banjo builder, especially not an amateur banjo builder. So the, the more professional, the professional makers that you see coming out now where their, their banjos don't sell for under 1300 or 1400. And, and really most of them, they try to sell for 2000 or 3000 or God forbid more. That's because they're, they put a lot of hours into these instruments and they're trying to get a good hourly wage. And that's I've never really concerned myself with an hourly wage. So Will McLennan gave us five sterling pounds over there in England. Thank you, Will. And Olivier gave me two dollars Canadian and says, what about Maple Ridge banjos or Ozark banjos? I don't know anything about those those two companies. I've never I've never heard of Maple Ridge, but I know Ozark banjos are typical overpriced. Um, you're paying for inlays and stuff and. You know, they're using they're using basically the same all, all the materials that anybody I don't want to like talk, talk too much crap on anybody. But all of the materials that all these banjo makers today are using, they buy all their hardware, their hooks and their rims and stuff. Most of it just comes from a handful of sources like the nice hardware is made by Rickard and Balsam Banjo Works. And Balsam is the same company as Pisgah. So all these makers and I'm pretty sure Ozark and probably Maple Ridge is the same way. They're ordering all their parts from the same sources, um, and they're not. They're no. None of them are really doing anything innovative with the banjos, and none of them are really building historic banjos. I mean, if you want to play a banjo like this, there's not many people who are making them. There's certainly no large makers making them. There's guys like like Bob Anderson who works, you know, one man working in a shop, who build. He'll build you this banjo or something very close to it. And it's like an antique banjo, you know, so you got to go to the small, super, you know, expensive professional, you know, one guy artisan maker to get a nice banjo like this. So anything that you get from Ozark or any one of these other companies is just, you know, it's kind of just something off the bench. Run, they're really kind of run of the mill and uh, and they they're overpriced. You know, I would not buy one new whatever you do. Um, Get them used because people, the people who buy these things new, they pretty quickly, they either love it or they pretty quickly get dissatisfied with it. And it goes up on the market. You'll see it for sale all the time. And they're selling the damn thing as quick as they can to move on. So if you want to get one of these banjos by a new contemporary maker, I would get it used. I would not do not pay full price. Uh, what these guys are asking for these banjos is kind of prohibitive. And I understand they got to get an hourly wage and stuff, you know, because it's they're trying to make it their profession. But I'm just telling it to you straight. Well, old Cole Cole says he enjoys bending the neck when he's ending a song. But he likes. Wow. So you actually, Cole, you actually what do you actually do? You, I've never done that. You hold the rim tight against your chest and you actually pressure at the nut to bend the neck. I've never done that, man. Um, and I really I don't know. I would not I would not recommend that. What you'll see me when I want to make it ring, I just move it.
I'll just kind of move the whole banjo to get that slight ringing sound. I've never actually bent it. I, I wouldn't mess with that. Tucker Deaton asked me if I like Uncle Dave Macon. Yeah, sure. I like Uncle Dave. He's not my favorite go-to. Like I couldn't, I've never like, there are some people who will sit and listen to like a two disc set of Uncle Dave Macon, like nonstop and love every minute of it. I'm, I'm not one of them people. I think his music is a little, a little hard to take. It's, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's, a lot of it's not really folk music. It's not really, it's not terribly traditional. A lot of it is like showboat, you know, commercial music. So you have to, you have to acknowledge it for what it is. And that's not really my, my forte. That's not my go-to, but I appreciate uncle Dave. I love the tricks he did. I mean, he was a, a master musician and uh, he was uh, certainly made a real spectacle on stage. Oh, 
all caved in. That's one. Um, my probably my favorite recording of that song is by Retta Spradlin. She did that. Uh, I think she was from Kentucky too. She called it the Pea Fowl. And then the other, probably the other famous recording of that is um, Bascom Lamar Lunsford. He did it on, I think he might, I'm not sure if he did it acapella or what. I haven't heard that, but he called it Swananoa Tunnel. And somewhere you can find, there's one of the earliest, one of the closer to the original, I guess it's probably originally a black work song. There's a guy named Will L William Love who did a very early acapella recording of Swananoa Tunnel, and he was black. And I, th I think that's that may be the only recording of that song by a black person. And it's it's very likely that it originated in the black tradition. With a lot of that stuff, we don't know for sure. So Dill XD220 asks how the watermelon is. This watermelon's okay. This ain't the best one. I got this from the grocery store down the road. And it's not as good. I usually go to a produce stand that's that way, and they actually have a lot better watermelons. But they charge more for a big watermelon. They're charging like ten bucks this year, and like shit, you know, that's kind of hard for me to do. Ten dollars for a watermelon, no matter how big, is kind of hard for me to pay. Um, so down at the grocery store, if I go this way instead, you can get a big watermelon for six bucks and it's not as good, you know, so it's like I can see he's charging ten dollars for his watermelons down there because they're damn good. But it's OK. So Misty, I normally, um, like last year, last year we grew a ton of watermelons here, right out in the front yard here. It's like kind of the perfect place for them. And we grew, um, we grew a watermelon called Art Combe's Ancient Watermelon. So if you, if you look up Art Combe, C-O-M-B-E, watermelon, those are a really good watermelon. They're full of seeds, but it's a really old um, heirloom from southwestern United States. I mean, I guess originally it would have come from Africa because that's where watermelons come from. But this is an heirloom out of the out of Arizona or New Mexico called Art Combe's Ancient Watermelon. We grew those last year and they were really good. You get big long melons. Some of them crook up. Some of them put a crook neck on them, just like a little crook neck squash. So that's really cool. I don't know why why they were bred that way by ancient people. Presumably bred them that way, maybe so they could carry them easier. I don't know. But some of those Art Combe's ancient watermelons actually have a crook neck on them. But that's a notoriously good watermelon. They're sweet. They're good. They're full of seeds. But, you know, that's the name of the game with an heirloom watermelon. Uh, I guess what I'm eating here is some kind of some sort of seedless watermelon, you know, from from Texas or Florida or, or something. This year, this spring was so cold. Like to get watermelons here, you need to plant them in like June. And our June was too cold. It was like cold and rainy through June. We had frost all the way up through May. And, and June was kind of chilly. It didn't really start getting hot here till July. So I planted a lot of watermelon seeds in early July, around July 4th. But I don't think they're going to have time. Watermelon needs lots of heat, needs lots of sun, and it needs lots of rain. And we didn't have, we didn't have the, uh, the sun and the heat this year. We had plenty of rain. So I have a couple, I have a bunch of watermelon vines growing, but our watermelons are like that big. And it's already, the nights are cooling off here. Like at night, it gets down to like 60 degrees here. That's too chilly for a watermelon. Same thing with my hot peppers. Out back, I'm growing a bunch of hot peppers. They didn't do too good this year. It's always a challenge to grow hot peppers and watermelons in the mountains. And this year was one of those years where our spring was just too cold to really get, to get a good start on them.
So Ryan Rao is asking me about Thompson and Odell. And he doesn't know anything about them. So unfortunately, Ryan, Thompson and Odell were kind of a cheaper, kind of cheaper makers. They mostly built knockoffs until until about 1888. They made this banjo, this Luscombe banjo. So this banjo says Luscombe, but it was designed by Luscombe. It was actually built by Thompson and Odell, 1888, 1890 or so. And so they made really good instruments when they built this. But the earlier instruments they built were just kind of knockoffs. They mostly copied um, Washburn. They copied Fairbanks. They copied Stewart. They copied everybody. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be a good banjo or not. I mean, it, they knew how to make them, so it, it may be a good banjo. But um, but. I, I just don't know. I don't know that much about them. I just know that their, their pre-1890s banjos were all copies. They may have made good copies. I just don't know for sure. Oh, so Chris Amato gave us $2.99. Thank you, Chris. Ninky says, could watermelon rind be dried to be used as part of a banjo build? I don't think so. You could build a temporary banjo out of a dried watermelon rind, but you need a gourd. There's something about watermelons don't, don't harden as they dry like a hard shell gourd is really what you need. So, Ninky, with your watermelon rind, I suggest you, if you want to do something with watermelon rinds, look up pickled watermelon rind recipes. My mother used to pickle... Every time we ate watermelon in the summer, she would take them and she'd skin them and just cut out the white parts of the rind. And she pickled that stuff in jars. It's easy to do. And if you do it right, it tastes it tastes amazing. She did. She would always she was sort of uh, notorious for her pickled watermelon. But she just took the rinds and she skinned the green and the pink off of them. So you just had the white parts and they were damn good. Mm. So Sean O'Rourke asks me for $5 to elaborate on the fiddle centric festival scene, particularly the capo on the second fret, which seems ubiquitous now. That's another thing. Where does capoing the banjo at the second fret come from? Where does tuning the fiddle all the way up to A come from? I can't, I can't find certainly can't find very many field recordings of fiddle players where they're tuned up to A. Look at like Hiram Stamper. Hiram Stamper never tuned his banjo up to A. And I guarantee you that no banjo player who ever played with Hiram Stamper ever put a damn capo on the second fret to play with him because Hiram's not tuning his band, his fiddle up to A. They didn't do it. So most old field recordings you hear of fiddles they're down and they're tuning it, you know, G and lower. They tuned it by ear. They tuned it to their voice. They tuned it to the banjo. And the banjo is almost always tuned lower because the banjo is always tuned, uh, you know, to the voice almost always. And if not, it's tuned to the, the fiddle. I mean, like what I'm getting at is that it's just tuned by ear. There's no reason to twist these pegs all the way up. And like the capo. Did Roscoe Holcomb ever play with a capo? No. Did Virgil Anderson ever play with a capo? No. Did Retta Spradlin, Cousin Emmy, um, Uncle Dave Macon, uh, John Snipes, Dink Roberts, uh, Odell Thompson, did any of these people ever put a capo on their banjo? No. So that tells me, I mean, the earliest evidence you can find of somebody putting a capo on a banjo and a damn driving a, a spike in here so they can capo this fifth and twisting it all the way up to A that's probably something that comes with the term claw hammer out of New York City, out of Washington, D.C. in the 1960s. It's a festival tradition from the 60s. So that's another reason why I don't own a capo. And I haven't owned a capo in over 10 years. When I, when I, I didn't own one my whole childhood because I didn't learn with the capo. The tradition that I was raised in, we had no use for capos because you tuned the banjo low to your voice to accompany singing. You have to sing with the banjo. 
and you cannot sing in A, most people can. So I never had a capo growing up. It wasn't until I was out of the army, moved up to Boone, North Carolina, started to go into Appalachian State University that I saw, oh, every banjo player up here has a capo. So I, if I want to play with these people, I got to get a capo. So I bought a capo up there. And even then, I still was kind of like rejected from the scene. So I eventually gave my capo away, got rid of it. And I have not bothered with the damn capo. I don't have any use for it. I love playing with other people. But if somebody wants to play with me, then they need to meet me at G or F or even lower. The music sounds better. The strings feel better. And you can actually sing in F and G a little bit. You can't sing in A. So that's one. I don't know the details and ins and outs of that. But I'd be willing to bet that tuning the band, the fiddle up to A and capoing the banjo at A, I'm pretty sure that comes from 1965, New York City. Uh, it's not traditional. Um, and yeah, the fact that it's ubiquitous right now, if you go to any festival or you look at any, any old time band playing on a live stream or something that we've been relegated to now, you'll see that the, you know, the banjo is usually capoed up if it's playing with the fiddle. And that's nonsense, if you ask me. And you notice that these people don't, they don't sing with the music because you really can't sing in A, very few people. So Southern Haint Stories asked me, what's in the garden this year that we're growing? I mean, we always grow, um, we always grow okra. We always grow tomatoes. We always grow corn. And we always, always grow um, pole beans and field peas. We always grow kale. We always grow collards. We have perennial herbs that grow every year. Um, so, I mean, our herbs, our, our perennial herbs consist of, you know, sage, bee balm, lemon balm, um, Tulsi, which is Tulsi, they call it holy basil. It's a really good type of basil that takes on. We've got rosemary. I'm looking at St. John's wort. I'm looking at different kinds of mint down here. So like near the near the kitchen door, I like to grow chocolate mint. That's my favorite um, like tea drinking mint because I'll, I'll actually mix. I'll make the tea and I'll get, strain the leaves out and I'll put cocoa powder in there with my chocolate mint tea and damn makes a good hot cocoa. But we just did the basic crops this year. A ton of okra. Okra kicked off this year. Great. And you know, I always do a little bit of corn. Sometimes I do more corn than I did this year. Um, corn's great because you can get multiple harvests of corn in one year. And my pole beans that I planted in the spring are just now starting to slow down and crap out. But in, uh, in late July, early August, I planted more pole beans. So we're going to get more, more beans coming in. And I'm still waiting on my, my cow peas, my field peas. They haven't done anything yet this year. And we always grow a ton of squash. I mean, I grow those little white um, scallop squash, we call them. Some people call them uh, flying saucer squash. Always grow those, always grow zucchini, always have good success with those. Um, and I try to grow gourds every year, but this year my gourds haven't. Last year we grew some good gourds, but we didn't really grow any good gourds this year. I think gourds take a lot of heat to grow a good gourd. Let's see, I'm going to go through and try to get some stuff. Oh, Noah Klein has is, is got a, a good comment about the capo thing I was talking about. Um, I'm going to see if I can. Noah, what did, you, what did you say, Noah? So Noah says, I remember reading that some did tune up to A without a capo. Uh, thinking of the country rec county records, Clawhammer volume, there's a couple recordings where they're almost tuned up to B and E. Yeah, Noah, I know what you're talking about. I think especially... Um, are, are you talking maybe like round peak players, like around Western Carolina? Maybe that's where it comes from. Cause there was kind of a lot of people played a sh homemade short scale banjos. Like um, Kyle Creed was the banjo player who basically taught all those people how to play claw hammer. And Kyle Creed was a banjo maker. He made short scale banjos. Um, and on a short scale, those short scale banjos, I know that, I know that Kyle Creed would often, he pretty much tuned up to like G sharp or a, and then the fiddle could too. So there is, yeah, there is. I mean, I spoke, I guess I spoke with too much generalization there. You could find some regions where they did tune up that high, certainly to G sharp and stuff. 
that did happen. But I guess when I'm speaking generally, I'm speaking about, you know, in general, most traditional banjo playing that I've heard on old recordings, it seems to be played out of the lower key, F, maybe G, but usually, usually it's lower. I mean, like listen to, uh, you know, Retta Spradlin, for example, in that, uh, the P-Fowl recording. I think that's, I don't think she's up to G on that one. Um, and just like, yeah, like I'm thinking there's there's some great fiddle recordings on that Mike Seeger um, field recording compilation. It's called um, Close to Home. There's some great solo fiddle on there that is clearly not tuned up to A. And I think you'd have you'd, you'd have more trouble finding fiddle and banjo players, especially banjo players. You'd have more trouble finding musicians in the old early field recordings tuned up to A. Uh and you'd have you'd have a much easier time finding people that were down to what we would call today down tuning. Of course, back then, you know, they didn't think of it as down tuning. It was just they just tuned the banjo, you know. So uh, old Cole Cole says we're 100 percent wood spun pots product of sellers in Appalachia, old world skills and new world forest. When did metal overspun pots take over and then retreat again? So, I mean, the, the hundred percent, I guess when you say a hundred percent wood pot, you mean it's just a piece of wood that's steamed and bent and glued and tacked in place. They were probably doing that in the, in the 1700s. We just don't know for sure. I mean, almost every banjo that you have, almost every banjo that you have a description of from before the 1830s, that's, if, if they describe it at all, it's described as a gourd banjo. So it was probably done early on because, I mean, those were skills that lots of people, lots of people could steam, could steam and bend wood into a hoop. I mean, it was a common skill in the 1700s and 1800s. But... Of course, you know, Joel Sweeney and um, William Boucher, they get the credit for designing the first banjo that we know about for sure that had a steam bent um, frame rim that they call it. And that was in the 1830s, 1840s. So you could say 1840 is when the gourd banjo basically faded from the mainstream and was replaced by the steam bent rim banjo. Um, and then I, I, it wasn't, they experimented in the, in the 1860s and 1870s with spun over rims where they actually put the metal cladding outside of a wood rim. That was to keep them from going, from losing their round shape and to make them heavier and make them a little louder sounding. It really wasn't until the 18, probably the 1880s that that kicked off. And I think SS Stewart was, I think the first maker who started putting out and saying that, you know, the metal clad spun over rim is the best way to make a banjo. And of course, if you ask Stewart, he'd say that's the only way to make a banjo probably. And SS Stewart, I mean, in the 1870s, his banjos weren't all spun over, I don't think. But if you go into his 1880s, 1890s and on, yeah, pretty much every single SS Stewart banjo was spun over. And, you know, they sounded great. And he set, he set the trend on that. So people copied him like, you know, Fairbanks, Cole, um, Odell Thompson, and they all sort of copied that idea that you needed some kind of metal spun over rim. And of course, you know, this banjo was designed by John Luscombe, and this is actually a solid metal rim. It's not spun over. It's, it's two pieces of nickel plated brass that are sandwiched together. And then you can see in here, there's actually a hard, thin maple tone ring that goes down this far. So they put a, a they took two pieces of nickel plated brass and they put this metal tone ring in the middle and somehow they pressed that together. I don't know how the hell they did that. So this rim is is solid metal. It's not spun over. So this is an unusual design that you really only, you only see in the Luscombs because of course they patented this and they Thompson and Odell who made this they wouldn't let anybody else make it. Okay, let me go cruise back up. I think I missed some of these super chats. Let's see here. Oh, 
we'll see if I can find one. So Josh Sullivan gave us uh, $10. He said, when you make your own banjos, what type of stain do you finish them with? I, um, I've, I've done a video about that. I make my own. There's a, a huge walnut tree right out here. It's a black walnut. And every year it dumps a ton of walnuts, more walnuts than we can process and eat. Um, so what you do is you get those walnuts and, you know, if you ever seen walnuts drop, they drop in a bright green husk. But those bright green husks actually produce this beautiful dark. We use it to stain this, this lattice here. It makes this beautiful, dark, rich, you know, black walnut stain. So that's what I use. Um, on all my stuff, if I'm going to um, if I'm going to stain anything, a piece of furniture, a banjo, um, whatever, a tabletop, something like that, I will use that that black walnut stain. It's great. You can stain skin heads with it too, and you can look up ways. That's easy. You basically just gather a ton of those walnuts, and you wait till the husks start turning brown and they, they soften. And you probably want to wear some gloves because it'll stain your hands dark yellow if you don't. Um, so put you some gloves on and then peel all those soft husks out. I've actually got a bucket of it right now brewing. I'll be right back. <laughs> so you see in there, that is a bucket of walnut husks look how look at that black ink dripping off of it so you get you a bucket full and um, what I do is I just once I get a good little bucket of husks like that I just lay them out and let, let the bucket fill up with rain and then I'll pull it back under the porch and I will just let it I'll let that water evaporate off of it until and so as it evaporates you start getting this really dark, it steeps, and you get this black, you get this black ink, and it will stain, it'll stain, it's going to stain the hell out of my fingers, you can't, you can hardly get it off, so that's what I use, Josh. Oh, let's get us another super chat here. So Sean O'Rourke gave us five bucks and said, I really enjoyed your video on trance banjo. Is the trance like state you go into just two finger picking? Do you often slip into this state? It doesn't have to be just two finger picking. It's probably usually, usually when I'm two finger picking, for some reason, I'll trance out. It seems like when you're playing overhand drop thumb style banjo, it seems like it seems like it's a little more involved. You have to keep repeating that same motion over and over again, you know. Um, but when you're two finger picking, you can develop this kind of, I don't know what the, like, uh, you can get this momentum going and probably three finger pickers really do it. Like if you look at Earl Scruggs, Doc Watts, or, um, out when you're three finger picking for sure. But you can even do it, I do it two finger picking all the time. It's something about that momentum of two finger picking and especially in like the, you know, the dark, um, sort of the darker, like minor tuning, um, I will really slip into a trance pretty easily. It doesn't have to be two finger picking, but usually is. Um, so Bambooza gave us $5, said, can you explain your process for learning to sing a new song? Do you learn to sing it before you play it while learning or after? That's a good question. Um, I guess probably, yeah, you know, if I if I hear a song that I like, to me, you know, they're all songs. I don't really play a lot of tunes. I don't think of them as, as arrangements of, of notes and tunes. I think of them as songs. So when I hear a song that I like, 
I'll pick up those words. And, uh, you know, usually if I'm, I'm driving home that night or whatever, I'll be singing it to myself. And once I sing it a hundred times or whatever it may be, then I will start to feel like where I, what, what parts I can sing, what parts I can't, how I need to adjust it to where I can sing it. And then by then, I usually know about what tuning I want to go to. And, uh, and from there, it's pretty easy for me to figure out how to play it on the banjo. So, but to answer your question, Bamboos, I probably do sing it. I generally, it, the music comes to me through the poetry, through the words and the language. So I do, if, if I'm going to learn something, it's because the words mean something to me. Uh, more than the melody or the, or the rhythm or whatever. So yeah, I learned to sing it and then I learned to play it on the banjo. And that's been true ever since I was a little kid. I mean, before I could play the banjo, I sung. Um, and so everything that I do on the banjo is really to accompany, you know, the human voice singing. And occasionally, I mean, there are some, some tunes that are just pure tunes I don't have words for. And those are generally to accompany dance. So the human rhythm of, of patting with your hands or dancing with your feet. Um, so the banjo to me is always accompaniment. I don't generally do, you know, a lot of, a lot of instrumental, just pure instrumental music that's not meant to accompany song and dance. So Toady Pants is asking, can you talk about the rhythm of two finger picking? So my two finger picking rhythm is the same as my overhand rhythm. So overhand rhythm, everybody knows the old boom chicka lick, you know, where you're going boom chicka, boom chicka, boom chicka, boom chicka. Well, two finger is the same. Boom chicka, boom chicka, boom chicka. So that's the basic way that I play two finger. Um, when it comes to like a two finger roll, all I'm doing is is what you're doing when you play overhand. You you drop thumb, so when I two finger roll, I'm really just drop thumbing. So I'll you know instead of doing that, I'm doing this. So my answer to that, you know, Toady is, it's the same rhythm, um, two finger or overhand, all the same. So Brian H. from uh, Australia says, can you recommend a tailpiece for, for nylon strings? So you tried your, your stock bluegrass tailpiece and it just cut the strings. It's a common problem, Brian. So if you can find any sort of antique tailpiece, all these antique tailpieces were made for gut strings, which is the same as nylon, functions the same way. So my recommendation is to get an antique tailpiece, like a no-knot. I think this is a line and Healy tailpiece. I'm not sure. But get you no-knot is the most common. Um and you can use the stock bluegrass tailpiece that's on your banjo. They just, they tend to have rough spots. So you need to go in with a small file or take you some fine sandpaper and put it on a, a narrow drill bit and work out those holes and smooth them out. So then it won't cut your strings. Because that's what pretty much will happen. The tailpiece will cut nylons or the, uh, the fifth string pip right here will be sharp. It'll cut it or, you know, the nut, the uh, the nut will be too sharp and it'll cut it there. So once you get all those smoothed out, you should be, you you're, should be okay with that with that bluegrass tailpiece. But the no knot is probably the one that you can just pick up. You can order one today from somebody. Uh, you know, Balsam Banjo Works sells a good um, reproduction no knot. They're not hard to find.
So old time Ian, I think, says on the Smithsonian website they have a mountain banjo that they have said was made between 1875 and 1899, which is the oldest date that he's seen. Can they be trusted? Are they trustworthy about that date? I wish they were, because I think that they probably people were probably making mountain banjos in the 1870s. They probably were. But was that particular banjo made in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s? We just don't know for sure. The earliest photographic evidence that we found for them is about 1910. Um, that's probably the earliest for sure date we have on the mountain banjo with the small head in the center. So um, I wish you could trust the Smithsonian on that date, but you probably can't because a lot of the, a lot of the dates, and this is true of lots of museum collections, the dates are just kind of slapped on there. People don't really know for sure. Um, but anyhow, it, it, may very, it may very well be that that banjo was made in the 1870s, but we just don't know for sure. And the Smithsonian doesn't know for sure either. They just kind of slap that on there. And honestly, in all likelihood, um, that banjo was, was probably made in the early 1900s. Um, Probably not as early as what they think you are. So Johnny G29 asks if I'm going to do any more online gigs. I don't think so, Johnny. I don't think anybody will have me. I tried to do one for um, Autumn Salon, but they fired me over all this fucking all this bullshit internet stuff. So it outlawed me pretty well. I don't think anybody's going to touch me for another live stream for a while. I did record a podcast uh, a few days ago. I did a long, like, three-hour podcast interview for this podcast in Germany. They're called Hallo Werner, and I think that should be out next week or in a week or two. And I, I played some music on that podcast. So there's that. Um, but, yeah, probably not. Probably not. If I'm going to live stream, I'm going to have to do it right here do it on my own. So Grant Hobson says, would you ever make a video on making tail pieces? Um, yeah, I mean, it's easy to make. I never thought about that. Um, they're pretty easy to make. And I think the, the trick with making a good wooden tail piece is you got to use a thin enough piece of wood. Um, that's the problem. Most people who, who make their first wooden tail piece and make it too thick. And a lot of times if you buy a wooden tailpiece from somebody that where they make tailpieces, then um, it's still it's usually too thick of a piece of wood. The trick to making a good wooden tailpiece is is getting it planed down real thin, like a quarter inch thick. Um, and so all the original antique tailpieces I've looked at on minstrel banjos are all quite thin, very hard wood. So that's a problem if you like I've make them out of. Um, if I, I've made a tailpiece, I have this really nice old block of cherry and I make things like tailpieces and tuning pegs with it. But cherry will is is hard, but it, it tends to crack. If you if you push it too hard, it'll it'll get brittle and crack on you. Um so something like that, it's tricky. If you make it really thin, it'll crack. So that's why people use stuff like ebony or persimmon uh, or really hard maple. Uh, to make to make that tailpiece. I like to use black walnut to do a tailpiece. Black walnut's pretty good about not cracking, um, as is most maple. The cherry sometimes will crack on you. I've had a few. I've had some people. I've built banjos for people with a thin cherry tailpiece, and I've had them crack and get and uh, get sent back to me and have to be replaced. So, I'm real careful about making cherry tailpieces now. So Chris Amato asks if I know any songs from the old time tradition that are thought to have Native American origins. I honestly, that's something that I think about all the time and I'm always looking for it. I can't find it. I can't find any good evidence of that. Um, it's almost like there was there was cultural overlap, you know, certainly between black and white pioneers, you know, the black and white pioneers came together. I mean, the blacks were generally enslaved. 
So they were generally brought by force by the white pioneers in the 1700s, early 1800s into the mountains, into this sort of deep south where this music mostly comes from. And so because black and white people on the frontier lived right on top of each other, I mean, they lived in very close quarters, they shared tons of music. And that's why it's really, it's almost silly at this point to say that, oh, that fiddle tune is black or that fiddle tune is white or that, that's, a, that's a black banjo song or you know, that, that's a white song. It's pretty silly in most cases to do that because mostly we really just don't know. And the black and white music has overlapped and been played side by side for so long that it's basically melded into one and the same. But it, from what I can tell, that didn't happen with Native Americans. So blacks and whites were living together, whether they wanted to or not. And when they encountered Native Americans, they tended to face off. And, and there, there is lots of people, there is lots of communities who kind of blended together. There's, you know, like there's, there are, you know, the Cherokees and stuff that still live in, in, in Appalachia to this day who never left. And they've always lived side by side with white people. And the Cherokees have a fiddle tradition. Um, but as far as I know, the Cherokees never picked up the banjo for whatever reason. I don't know why that is. And it may just be because contact, you know, the vast majority of Native Americans were killed, um, mostly by disease. They were wiped out by disease. And the few who remained in the South were physically violently pushed out. You know, we all know that by, eight, by 1840, there was very few Native Americans left in the Southeast. So it may have just been that the relationship between, you know, Anglo and Afro pioneers and indigenous people who were already living here, it may have just been that it was so bloody and adversarial that they didn't exchange a lot of music. Even when they exchanged DNA, they didn't exchange music the way that blacks and whites did. I mean, there's tons of evidence of Native Americans and whites and blacks mixing their genetics and raising families together. But for whatever reason, um, the music doesn't the music didn't really transfer over that much. It seems like Native Americans loved the fiddle, and I think Native Americans already had a fiddle tradition. But I don't know that there was any in the southeastern United States. I don't know that there was a Native American plucked stringed instrument tradition. They had stringed instruments, but these were fiddles. So I don't know. Um, so yeah, really, the answer to that is I don't. I really don't know. Um, there's there's very few songs that even mention Native Americans. One of them that's most common is called the Cumberland or the Cumberland Land or Old Cumberland, where they mention it's here in peace we wish to be with the Indian tribes in Tennessee. That's one of the only songs that even mentions Native Americans that I can think of. So, shit, man, I wish it was different. And I, if somebody can prove me wrong, I'd love to. Um, I'd love to know more about that. So Baltram Weasel asks if I can tell more about the German podcast or post something about it. I will. It's called Hallo Werner. And uh, when when the podcast comes out, I'll be sure to share it on Patreon. Right now, they're still, I guess those guys are still edi editing the um, the sound. So Baltram, it, it'll, I'll, I'll definitely put it, I'll share it all far and wide. I'll put it on Patreon, Facebook, whatever. So you'll know about it when it comes out. So Grant Hobson asks if oak would work. Yeah, for you talking about for a tailpiece, Grant, you could use oak. You just have to be careful with the type of oak you use. Um, like so, red oak, for example, red oak is great for making pots, for making a banjo rim, banjo pot. But red oak is really porous and grainy, um, fibrous wood. So if you try to make something like a thin tailpiece or um, like a, a, a little tuning peg out of red oak, it, it'll probably split on you. So you gotta be careful with that. If you use white oak, on the other hand, white oak and red oak are like almost two different species. They're so different. White oak is, is uh, if you get a good piece of white oak, it's really dense, it's not porous, it's not grainy. Um, so that would be my only thing. Learn to differentiate the types of woods because if you go to the the hardware store or whatever, or the lumber yard, and you just buy oak, a lot of times they just call it oak. They may not tell you if it's red oak or white oak. So make sure you get you get wet oak, uh, um, white oak, if you're gonna make a tailpiece. If you wanna make a banjo pot, I recommend using red oak. I think that's a great sounding wood, probably the best sounding banjo pot material, I think, 
is red oak. And you can even make the neck out of red oak if you're careful. But tuning pegs, um, nuts, bridges, tailpieces, you don't want to use red oak for that. It'll probably split on you. So Sean O'Rourke says, where did you learn Marching Through Georgia and could you play it? Um, yeah, I learned Marching Through Georgia from a recording of the Troxel brothers. Um, Clyde Troxel and his brother, I'm forgetting his, his brother's first name. But if you look up the Troxel brothers, T-R-O-X-E-L-L. -L. See how do I play marching through Georgia? Sang it as we used to sing it 60,000 strong when we was marching through Georgia. shouted when they heard the joyful sound how the turkeys gobbled that our commissary found how the sweet potatoes simply started from the ground when we was marching through georgia hurrah hurrah we bring the jubilee hurrah hurrah the flag that makes you free and so we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea when we was marching through Georgia. Marching through Georgia. That's one I'm going to have to do a lesson in. I'll do a tab on that soon. That's going to be a real tricky tab. Woo. So I'm freaking out, says, greetings from Michigan. We've got a good banjo tradition up here. Nothing like down where you're at, though. Yeah, I believe it. Oh, yeah. So Hilo Hilo says Native Americans had the mouth bow, which was a plucked instrument. Yeah, you did. You did. Mouth bow was this thing you put in your mouth and they would they would they would pluck that thing. They did a couple different ways. So, yeah, they had that for sure. Thanks for bringing that up, Hilo. Oh, well, everybody, I think. That's been a two hour live stream. I think I'm ready for a break and my dogs are whining. See these dogs, they wanna eat. It's time to feed puppies. So if y'all don't mind, I think, I'll, I think I'll close this for now. Somebody asked about, is there any, Joe asked, is there any old banjo history in the old west? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, as soon as people went out west, and any large numbers, they started going out there in the 1820s, 1830s. They carried the banjo with them. We just don't know that much about it. Um, 
you can look it up. Banjo playing was big in California in the 1850s, 1860s, but they all they played minstrel music and stuff. So the minstrel scene went 1830s, 1840s, the minstrel banjo and all the minstrel repertoire that went out west for sure. Um, but there was a there was a pre minstrel look up. Oh, what's his name? Uh, I forget his name, but there was a guy, there was a white man who was from Georgia. I forget his name, but he was an early Texas pioneer. He learned to dance. He learned to ham bone and he learned to play the banjo from enslaved black people in Georgia in the very early 1800s. So he was playing the banjo in Texas in the 1820s before Joel Sweeney ever even learned to play. Um, Oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. McAlpin Williamson was his name. His name was, um, I forget his first name, but his, his middle name was McAlpin and his last name was Williams or Williamson, McAlpin Williamson. I forget his first name, but he was a famous Texas pioneer. If you look up McAlpin Williamson, Texas, you'll find him. And he was, he was a famous Texas pioneer who played the banjo in the very early 1800s. And uh, I, I believe it was in, I want to say Western Texas. Okay, everybody, I'm going to, I'm going to close it out. Thanks for all the super chats. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll schedule the next one. And, uh, we'll do this again soon. Thanks a lot. I'm ending her. Y'all have a good one. Got to feed these puppies. Okay. Take care. Thanks a lot, everybody.